Well, let me say good, wel- uh, good morning and welcome to all of you who are here in person, many watching online. I'll put my amen to Pastor Joel's invitation there that we consider uh, being together, being one another people in baptism coming up later on this summer. And uh, we're continuing on in this series called The Benefits of One Anothering. And uh, last week, I really liked something that Pastor Ben highlighted, so I just want to resurface it here. Uh, this idea that this call to be one another people all throughout the New Testament, and, and I think it's such an important and elevated call that Jesus makes it a new command of love. So he does that in the book of John. John records Jesus saying, a new command I give you to love one another in the same way that we are to love God and love our neighbor as followers of Jesus, as people who are called by his name, we also have this invitation to love one another. And how our love for one another shows up, that, that's really been the focus of this series. We've seen that we're supposed to serve one another in, uh, uh, in humbly in love, that we're supposed to encourage one another, that we're called to spur one another on or cheer one another on toward love and good deeds. And t- today we're going to unpack uh, one of the uh, one of the one another invitations that uh, is pretty captivating, but it's also pretty unique. But before before we get there, um, one of the one another's we're not going to talk about in terms of a message, but it is in the scriptures. It's to confess to one another. So in the spirit of that one another, I have something to confess, and that's this um, really unfortunate thing that I've done over the past past few weeks, I've stirred a bit of grief and some consternation because I keep drawing attention to what is somewhat of an unwelcome reality that we're facing as a church, as a country, and and that's the fact that summer is more than halfway over. (laughs) And uh, it's not a fun thing to necessarily consider, especially when you realize that for many of us who live in the state of Minnesota, that maybe is one of the only reasons that we love living here, is the joy and the goodness of summer, sunny skies and open waters. And, uh, you know, yesterday this just hit me, the smell of people grilling food outside. It's, there's these really distinct moments, memories that come with summer. Or uh, we were out at the beach the other day, you can hear the water splashing. And our kids and our grandkids, many of you uh, may resonate with this, that this is just one of those seasons of life that can be really sweet. And there's good memories and good things that happen. And, and that's maybe where in, in our particular family, we, have, we, we experience a bit of the irony of summer. And with all of its goodness, it is really tiring. And, you know, we, we've maybe been very intentional to have kind of a packed summer to keep our kids away from the constant lure of screens or from getting so bored that they decide to, you know, pick on one another and then more fun erupts from that. And uh, so we've done camps and road trips and swim lessons and play dates. I mean, you name it, we've, we've tried to get our kids involved in some way in those activities. And well, maybe in the spirit of confession, I'll just keep going. If you, if you start confessing, you'll just realize you, more stuff just will come out of you. And uh, the other thing I need to confess is that we have not cracked the code as a family on a screen-free summer. Okay, so we, we've had our fair share of summer movie nights, and uh, we've gotten stuck in a string of random YouTube videos. I don't know if you've experienced this before, but you start watching one, and... An hour later, you're like, how did we get here? (laughs) And so we've we've tried to turn that to good. um, And uh, what has emerged as kind of a summer evening tradition is we've gotten onto a string of music videos. And so we play a few music videos. And then unsurprisingly, a little bit of a dance party starts to get going in our family. And it's a strategy we're using to get our kids tired enough that (laughs) when bedtime rolls around, you know, when their head hits the pillow, they're actually going to go to sleep. Uh, after they brush their teeth, of course. So uh, now, uh, just to give you a bit of our family, the musical tastes in our family, so you can ha- get to know us a little bit here. Uh, they, there's a range, unsurprisingly. So there's pop. We have some that like pop or hip-hop. Country music. My wife's a country music fan. And then 
We have classic rock in our family, American classic rock. Okay, now I can thank my dad for that. And I don't know if I've shared this with you before, but my dad was actually in a cover band when he was a young adult. And they would play in outdoor you know, amphitheaters, indoor venues, bars, all the like. And the, and the genre of music that was my dad's band was American classic rock music. So this is ACDC, this is the Doobie Brothers, Leonard Skinner, Fleetwood Mac. You know, if you have something from that genre or era of time, you could tell my dad to sing it and he likely would be able to. And what, now here's something that also is unfortunate, but uh, that musical gene did not get passed down to me. And in fact, I hear from a lot of people that have musical talent that it typically skips a generation. So I'm hoping that my kids in some way just grab onto that. That's just sometimes an uncanny ability. If you know people or maybe you yourself have some musical talent, uh, like they can just find perfect pitch just like that or they can pick up any instrument and it actually sounds good. Uh, maybe one of my kids will take on that mantle for my dad. And, and as I talk about some of that, doesn't music just have this draw to it in our lives? In fact, I'm sure as I listed some of the musical tastes of my family, some of you were cheering inside. And others of you probably wondered, how come he didn't mention orchestral symphonies? Or what about jazz music? Or what about indie or folk? Or some of you might be fans of the blues or heavy metal. There, there's just this range of different genres that are out there. And, and they span a bunch of different tastes and styles and preferences, memories. But maybe the thing that's for certain is that music is undeniably a part of our human experience. I mean, if you're married, you, you probably remember the song that you walked out to or what played when you had your first dance with your spouse or with a parent. Or you may recall, this might be like a, a mile-marking moment in your story, the first record you ever bought or the first eight track, or cassette tape, or CD, or MP3 that you may have downloaded. I mean, there's this sense that there may be a song or an artist that when you were growing up as a young person, you just looked up to him. There was this draw that you had to someone who had musical abilities, or maybe there's just a melody that just sits with you, and it's been a part of your story and your life for a long time. And so there's this beauty, there's this wonder to music. And, and as a Christian, as a Christian, it makes, me, it makes me ask the question, why? Well, why and how did God maybe place that within and around us? How, how is it that music can bring us to a place where when it starts and when it gets going, it, it can feel like we've entered into a new sense of our own being? It, it, think of this like visually, it's, it's almost like our very wiring has these strings attached to it. And anytime music hits our eardrums, it, it resonates with who we are and who we were meant to be. So how is it? How is it that that seems universal? All of us experience that. Or how is it that, how is it that this is what it means to be one another? That music is a part of our lives. Well, I, I don't know if any of you are C.S. Lewis fans. You probably know by now that I'm, I'm a fan because I bring him up in almost every message I've done. And so Lewis was this really brilliant, imaginative thinker, author. He was a theologian. And uh, he, he actually may be best known for a series of books that he wrote, fantasy uh, novel series called The Chronicles of Narnia. And it's really an allegory of the Christian story. And in that book, he casts Jesus as uh, this majestic lion named Aslan. And in one of the books, he kind of depicts creation happening, and he depicts it as Aslan, the lion, singing creation into being. Which, you know, there's, there's no explicit evidence in our scriptures to suggest that God sang the world into existence. But isn't that a pretty captivating idea? And, and so there, there, there is no evidence to suggest that it didn't happen that way, but I found some research this, uh, this week that I thought, I just wanted to share with you. It's really fascinating. And it, it shares that science, science is making some fascinating discoveries that sound and maybe even music sit at the very core and gateway of our existence. So NASA has been studying this for some time. And here's, here's a summary of their findings. So they say before stars or planets, before black holes and white dwarfs, before even atoms or rays of light, 
the universe reverberated something surprising, sound. Goes on to say, and it is still possible to pick up echoes of these first sound waves that spread across our early universe. And these echoes are providing astronomers with clues about some of the deepest mysteries of our world. So science, science is finding evidential remnants that sound, sound that's being channeled into order and beauty, which couldn't that be a really interesting definition of music? Sound being channeled into order and beauty. And as we read the creation account in Genesis, first book in our Bible, we, we can kind of understand that what science is discovering is best understood as the work of God. Okay, here, here are the first verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was hovering, or darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then this is the beginning of verse three. And God said. God spoke into formlessness and emptiness. And he created order and abundance. He formed the world and everything in it, and his voice, his voice, the ordered and abundant sound of his voice reverberated throughout existence. And now science even attests to the fact that there are even distant echoes of his voice still imprinted on the universe itself. And again, I, I know it can be a bit of an imaginative leap here, but I just love the idea that maybe, just maybe, as God's voice spoke, it had a musical nature to it. That the sound of his voice is ordered and beautiful and irresistible. And maybe, just maybe, that's why every culture and every people and every time period and every language and every age and every person has this draw to music. What, what, if, what if music is so compelling and so inspiring because it's the very beginning of who we are and the world that we live in? What if the reason music sits as one of the more memorable and beautiful dimensions of our lives is because God in his very essence and voice is musical? And again, I, the reason I also don't think that's maybe not too far-fetched of an idea is because that's where we're all headed. Uh, to say it again, uh, singing is what we're all going to be doing with one another someday in heaven when the world is finally back to how it was meant to be. In, in fact, the reason that I have some confidence in that is because the biblical author John uh, has this immense privilege of having a vision of what the life of heaven is going to be like one day. And he writes about it in the book of Revelation. We get a glimpse of it ourselves, so check out these verses. This is from uh, John in the book of Revelation. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And then, and then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they sang. Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. We and all creation will be singing together one day. We'll be enveloped in music, in melody, in rhythm, in poem, in sound, as we meet the very presence of God unfiltered and unhindered. And, and you know what music has a tendency to do, right? When you're in the presence of music or w when you're around a familiar tune, th there's almost this innate reaction that we want to join in, that we want to participate. And we start to tap our feet or we start to hum along or we... Think about adding our voice into the mix. And I, and I wonder if our heavenly experience will break out in song because the very presence and voice of God is irresistibly musical. Ordered and abundant sound that gives us life and gives us breath and it brings out beauty. And so what does this all have to do with us being one another people? Well, you've stuck me, with me this long. So, Here's our focus this morning. Ephesians 5. These are the words of Paul. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some, transla- uh, some translations, in fact, render the beginning of verse 19 there as sing with one another, which may seem like a bit of a unique invitation for us as we consider what does it mean to live as one another people? Because I'm sure you're thinking this, I, I can understand the calls to serve one another, to encourage one another, to spur one another, to spur one another on, even to confess to one another. Those things appear understandable, but to sing with one another? Why in the world? Why in the world is that part of how we love God and love one another? How is it that that is something that we should all enter into? Regardless of maybe our tastes in music or our abilities or even our comfortability to join in. In fact, as I was just thinking about this message and about this unique one another invitation, I I couldn't help but acknowledge that this might be one of the more difficult ones for us to embrace because music and song... uh, you know, it, it could evoke a little bit of anxiety. I don't know if any of you have ever been asked to sing a solo before. And it's just, nobody feels like they exactly want to jump right into that. And, and music, it probably generates some of the most strongest opinions as well. I mean, think about it. Even though music and song is so universal, it's part of every time period and language and continent and generation, you name it. It's undeniably part of our creativity but, but it elicits some of the strongest and most entrenched perspectives. I mean, the same way music can just hit our heartstrings and we feel resonance, sometimes music hits us and it can feel dissonance. It can feel as if the emotion that it evokes isn't exactly something that we want to feel. And, and I know that this is for sure the case because I serve as a pastor. And this is not meant to cast any judgment or to suggest it's not helpful or needed to speak up, but the number one piece of feedback that I receive, and this is any ministry, every Christian gathering I've been a part of, so this is not just a Westwood thing, but the number one piece of feedback I receive is about the music. (laughs) The volume, the pace, the length, the arrangements, the lyrics, the style, you name it. I have heard it. And I think it's a constant piece of feedback because music means a lot to us. Music shapes our experiences as we gather together to meet the presence of God. And and like I shared earlier, I truly believe that God has a musical dimension to his being. And so, unsurprisingly, there are opinions and there are perspectives and there are preferences and hopes about how music and song come together for us to meet God in worship. And so I, I hear the feedback and I hear the opinions on music as evidence that this really matters. And it should matter. Because the scriptures say that that we ought to sing with one another. That we're called to sing with one another. And this invitation, as it's lived out, uh, the the tastes and the preferences and the memories and the opinions that we have for music, they, they start to come to the surface. They come forward because we're also imagining and anticipating what it's gonna be like one day to sing with one another in the heavenly heavenly realms. And and so it's why I think Paul is actually kind of crafty in how he shapes this one another call. Because I I want you to look again at these verses in Ephesians, but I'm highlighting a different section of it now. So be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Some translations render that spiritual songs. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I I think what Paul is attempting to do here is he's suggesting that our singing does not need to have, maybe it shouldn't have a monotonous kind of tone to it or approach to it. In other words, he highlights that there's a range of musical and poetic expression that's available to us. Everything from psalms to hymns to spiritual songs to music from our own hearts. Basically, he's helping us see that some of the ways we express our connection to God and to one another can and will be different. So if I were to unpack just a few of the um, kind of term, some of the terminology that's in there, the Psalms, the Psalms are directly from our scriptures. And uh, they're in the New Testament, the book of Psalms, there's 150 divinely inspired poems. And they express worship or they express lament 
or praise or hope or truth. And as these poems were part of early worship, they were oftentimes accompanied by music, which is a little bit different than hymns, which again are poetic expressions of truth. But in this again, this is for Paul's day and age. They oftentimes were not accompanied by music. So remember, Paul's use of hymns right here, it, it actually predates our typical experience of hymns. Many of you may have grown up in Christian settings where hymns were very much a part of uh, your Christian worship and experience. But remember, th this was written before the first Christian hymnals were published. And so Paul's use of the term hymn here, uh, he's referring to what New Testament scholar Harold Honer defines as the practice of reciting generally poetic material in praise or honor of God. And then this is really interesting. And again, this recitation often happened without accompanied music. So, interestingly, what later developed as the Christian creeds, that actually may be a better understanding of what Paul's referring to here as early hymns. Which leads to another expression of how we can sing with one another. And that's this idea of songs from the spirit. Or again, what some other translations call spiritual songs. And so whereas the Psalms are these inspired words from God in our scriptures. And the hymns are these poetic recitations of God's truth. Spiritual songs, they kind of give us this opportunity to express our response to how God has been at work in our lives. And so these are songs that, again, are oftentimes accompanied by music, and they almost retell the grace and the mercies and the miracles that God has done, but from the singer's point of view, from our own experiences, from our own encounters with how God is on the move. And that leads to the final expression that Paul highlights here in this short, short section, and that's this idea that we're called not just to sing with one another, but also that we're called to sing from our own hearts to God himself. Uh, in other words, our singing is not just something that happens outwardly in the presence of God's people, but it's also something that can happen inwardly as we express ourselves to God. Uh, it, just think about it like this. There, there, there are songs to God. There are songs for God. There are songs about God that have never been heard before. There are melodies and poems and arrangements and lyrics that never hit our eardrums, but they reverberate from our hearts to the very ears of God himself. And he takes delight in our song and in our music to him. And, and you may be thinking what I've been thinking as I was preparing for this message. I don't think I've ever done that before. I mean, remember I told you the musical gene hopefully skipped over me and is going to land on one of my kids. I would now count myself as someone who has kind of a musical bone in my body. So have, have I ever sang a song to God from my own heart? Have, have I ever made music to God from my own being? I mean, just so you know, I can play Beethoven's Ode to Joy on the piano. It's my only kind of musical accomplishment after very short-lived piano lessons in the fourth grade. But other than that, I really don't think or express myself in song or in music. And so again, I was asking myself, can I, have I actually sang a song to God before for my own heart? And some of you may be thinking the same thing. And, and as I was kind of wrestling down that question, I decided this is good practice to read the verses again. And I saw something that, again, is maybe so obvious, but for some reason... I didn't notice it initially. And it reminds me of this profound truth that all of this beautiful work that we do in music and song, it's not my work. It's God's work first in me and through it. Look again at Ephesians 5 and look what's highlighted. Be filled with the Spirit. And then what follows? Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where does this unique and captivating one another begin? Well, at the end of what is verse 18 here, to be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit here being the Holy Spirit of God. The same Spirit, if we go back to Genesis 1, who's hovering over the world. 
It's the same spirit whose echoes are still heard into the very present. It's the same spirit that if he's within us, if that's how we're filled, then I think we may not even realize the songs and the music that come from our heart in thanksgiving to God. I I don't think that suggests that we maybe shouldn't intentionally endeavor to offer a song to God from our own hearts. And I realize for some of you like me that that may seem like an invitation just too far out of reach because you may not feel like you carry this innate musical ability. But I just want you to take heart that the Spirit is at work. He's at work in our hearts. And so be encouraged in the fact that the music and the songs that come from within us oftentimes also spring out of the singing that happens around us. In other words, when we sing with one another, not only are we offering encouragement to one another in our song, but we're, we're allowing our hearts to be attuned to songs that could be reflected back to God, and the Spirit might do that in ways that we don't even realize. Okay, before we wrap up today and before we come into this table to celebrate communion, I want to read one more set of verses for you. This is from the prophet Zephaniah in the Old Testament. And just look at these verses. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, in his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Did you know that God sings over you? That God takes such delight in you, that he has such love for you, that his joy for you overflows in singing, in song, in melody, in music, in abundance. It's why, again, I think kind of this captivating idea that God sang the world into existence, it's why I don't think it's all that far-fetched It's why I think the very reason we have this draw to music is because God put it within us. Because that's who God is. He himself has a musical kind of dimension to him and it's why I think he unsurprisingly calls us to be singing people. To sing with one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and to sing from our own hearts to God. And I know this wondrous, albeit sometimes maybe a bit uncomfortable invitation, it's how we love God and how we love one another, how we become the kinds of people God has called us to be, how we be in love like Jesus is wrapped up, it's caught up in this call to sing to the God who sings over us. A God who holds together the universe with the captivating sound of his voice, a voice whose echoes are still stamped under the universe itself. And as we enter into communion this morning, I pray that you again get to meet that God, a God who sings over you, a God who invites us to sing with one another and to make music from our own hearts to him. It's a beautiful, beautiful invitation. May not be the one that we thought we would hear to sing with one another, But it's in our scriptures and it's in our call. It's in God's very nature. It's in our own hearts. And so as we prepare for communion, can I invite you to open your hands with me here across all of our campuses online? I want to offer a blessing and a prayer as we enter into this moment to be again with the presence of God. So Lord, thanks for, thanks for a unique invitation that we are called to be singing people. And thanks for the beautiful picture, the beautiful truth that you are singing over us right now. And maybe the only response we can have back is to sing back to you. It's what we're going to do one day when we're all gathered together in the heavenlies. So maybe we're just preparing. Maybe we're just practicing for what will be such a significant and beautiful part of our lives forever. We will be singing people. And as we do that, God, may we be encouraged that the echoes of your voice are stamped under the universe and to our very souls, drawing us back to your presence. A presence that I'm just so captivated to say might be more musical than we think. So may that beautiful picture draw us in right now as we sing to you again in Jesus' name. Amen.